Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's all stand in the house and begin our service on this fine Wednesday afternoon. We can just give God some praise in the church house tonight. Let's just lift up some glory to heaven tonight. Let's just show him that we appreciate him for all that he does with a little bit of praise. Let's return something to heaven tonight. We're going to start out our service with a time of prayer tonight, seeking after the face of God for our needs and our desires. So if you have anything tonight that you've brought with you into this place, if you need a miracle, if you need a life-changing event to take place in your life, bring it to God tonight. Let's exercise a little faith in this place right now. If you have a need, step forward. If you have a desire, step forward. If you have a dream, step forward. And let's pray for one another. Let's lift up hands for one another. Let's just be there and support each other in the presence of Almighty God. If you would, pray with me over every need that's in the house tonight. Lord, we just want to come to you and seek after your holy face tonight, Lord. God, we need you tonight in this house. We need you, Lord. God, there's a group of people here that's not going to turn their back on you, Lord. There's a group of people here tonight that still have faith to believe that you're a God that still heals. You're a God that still fights off the enemy. You're a God that still surrounds us with a barrier of protection, Lord. You're a God that still makes a way out of no way. Lord, you're the one that can handle it all. You're the one that can handle every situation that comes our way, Lord. God, tonight we're going to cast all of our cares on you. Tonight we're going to let you have it, Lord. Whatever it may be, sickness, desires, dreams that we wish would come true in our life, Lord. God, I pray that there are things that are going to be birthed in this house tonight that are going to be able to launch us to be able to further the kingdom, Lord. God, I pray you would have your hand on this service tonight, Lord. I pray that you would have your hand on each and every one of us in this place. God, I pray that you would just have your way tonight, Lord. I pray that you would see the faith that's in this place.
I've got to make up in my mind that I'm going to praise him at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. In the bad times, I'm going to praise him. When I'm going through the storm, I'm going to praise him. Whenever I'm riding high, I'm going to praise him. Whenever I'm down in the valley, I'm going to praise him. Because no matter what I'm going through, no matter what my life looks like at any given time, he is still good. He is still God. He is still on the throne. He is still the one that is in control. And I will praise him. At all times. We praise Him by showing up. We praise Him by getting up saying, Thank you, Lord, for a new day. We praise Him by coming to church. We praise Him with our offering. Well, tonight, we're going to give. We're going to praise Him with our offering. We're going to praise Him with our giving. We're going to invest in the kingdom tonight. And if you don't know how to give, we have many, many ways that we can give here at the River Bend Pentecostals. We have Givelify. We have PayPal at the riverbendpentecostals.com. If you're out there listening over the Internet, you can send cash or checks in the mail to Riverbend Pentecostals at P.O. Box 477 here in New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. We have the old-fashioned way of giving. We've got the pans across the front, and every one of them are fair game tonight. You can drop it at anything you want. But tonight, we're going to declare faith over this offering. We're going to pray together over this offering, that the Lord's going to bless it, that He's going to bless us, that He's going to bless generations to come, Brother Terry. So if you, are, if you would stand with me, if you're not already, let's just declare faith in the house tonight over this offering, if you'll pray with me. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings, and I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken, I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, and I am blessed going out, and all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jesus Christ is Lord forever.
I'm going to tell you, church, we got something to praise him for tonight. If you haven't noticed, just look around at how many people are here on a Wednesday night. It almost looks like Sunday morning in here. Our youth group is growing. Our children's church is growing. We're growing spiritually. We're growing closer to God. We got something to praise him for in the house tonight. Well, tonight, we're going to start transitioning into the main part of the service. We could have Riverbend Kids come line up up here on this side. We could have Riverbend Ignited come over here on this side. got a new tradition we've been doing here where we've been praying over all these young people. Church, this is the next generation that's coming up that's going to carry the gospel out into this world. This is the generation that's going to be able to take what you all have laid as a foundation and we can build on it. We're going to take it. We're going to run with it. But we've got to have support under these young people. We've got to have prayer. We've got to have people that are going to back them along their journey in this faith. So if y'all would, just stretch a hand out in faith and let's pray over the children, let's pray over the young people, and let's just pray that we can be what God wants us to be and what He needs us to be for this time, for this generation. So God, I want to pray right now, Lord, that you would just help us tonight. Lord, we've got a fine-looking crowd of young people here in this church that are ready to go to work for you, Lord. God, I pray that you would just equip us, God. I pray that you would help us be able to reach the next step in our journey, Lord, that you would help us be a missionary to the people who need it, that you would help us be a witness, that you would help us be the light, that you would help us be the answer to this generation, Lord. God, you've got a group of workers right here that are ready to go out into the field, that are ready to go out into the streets, into the highways and the hedges, Lord. We've got a group of people that are ready to go to work for you, Lord, but we've got to be, we've got to be behind them. Lord, we've got to keep them safe from the enemy. Lord, we've got to keep them on the right path, God. And we just want to pray tonight that you would help us with that, Lord. That you would just reach a hand down from heaven. That you would touch each and every one of these young people, Lord. That you would just keep your hand on them so that we could go to work for you, Lord. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Sister Chris, then you take them on back. River been ignited. Y'all follow right on behind them. Let's all give the man of God a hand clap of praise tonight as he comes to this pulpit to deliver the word of God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Richard. We know all praise goes to the Lord. Amen. I will tell you, I'm very apprehensive about breaking into this tonight because, thank you, Brother, because you be seated. Um, because of uh, the next two Wednesdays, I will not be speaking. I'll be gone the next Wednesday on vacation and with my lovely bride. And uh, uh, if she still goes with me, if not, I'll be going by myself. <laughs> Might be going to Marston like Brother McKinney used to say. But uh, uh, but at any rate, Amanda, Sister Amanda and I will be on vacation uh, we'll be going tomorrow and Friday and be home Saturday. We're going to district conference in Wentzville, and then we will leave Sunday after church. I will be here Sunday morning. We'll leave Sunday morning after church and uh, go on vacation. And then uh, this coming up Wednesday, uh, Brother Tripp will be speaking. Then Sunday, Brother Richard will be speaking. And then Wednesday, Brother Blake will be speaking. And uh, I may be back that Wednesday, but... Brother Blake's going to speak whether I am or not. So I said all that to say, number one, y'all will be here. Mm -hmm. And uh, you need to hear a different voice. Uh, I mean that very serious, sincerely. And you won't get any better voices than the guys on this team. 
and they do an incredible job, and I have no qualms about them ministering. I would probably let them minister more if I didn't love it so much. Uh, but uh, they uh, do an incredible job. And then, uh, um, uh, so I'm starting this series tonight knowing that I will not get into it for the next two Wednesdays. Um, I can wait in my mind today to back off from it, but I really feel like the Lord wants us to bring it on. So uh, be prepared that I might just teach it again in three weeks, this part right here. But uh, I'm only going to get through three verses of the book of Jude. It's a uh, rather long book, as you well know. And uh, uh, it's actually only 20 Five verses, so we're basically going to get through one eighth of it tonight. And uh, everybody has a handout that wanted one. I just found out recently some people don't be getting them, which uh, I'm, I'm glad of that if you don't want it, because then I have to clean it up after you leave. But I would encourage you, if you can, write some notes. They become an incredible tool for you. They become an incredible tool for you. Um, so feel free to use them, and uh, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell it, but I'll just ask forgiveness instead of permission, but Brother Terrence is actually going to start teaching Be Not Deceived as a home Bible study um, to somebody. That's what we just gave him. Uh, and I'll tell you right now, ain't nothing I teach belong to me. It all belongs to the Lord. So you got a handout, you got some stuff, feel free, let it fly. That's what we intended. Remember that? Yeah. That's what we intended. And, and I'm not supposed to tell this either, but somebody came to me. I, I'm, I'm just being facetious because if I'm not supposed to tell it, I don't tell it. All right. But uh, somebody came to me the other day, and they were so happy because their son, who is in this room right now, had written the notes down. From something and they ran into a problem and he just took the notes and put them on another paper and handed it to her and said here this will help you this, that's how it's supposed to work amen that's how it's supposed to work so uh, nevertheless let's let's ride with it a little bit book of Jude uh, the book of Jude is generally believed to have been written by the man whose name it bears it's the same as Judas or Judah the book of Jude, same, same name. Um, it's written in the last half of the first century, so somewhere probably between 60 A.D., which would be about 30 years after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and 100 A.D., so somewhere about between 30 and 70 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, he was most likely... The earthly brother of Jesus Christ, which would have made him obviously a half-brother, same mother, different fathers. And uh, he was also a brother to James, who was the head of the church at Jerusalem, who plays a, a pivotal role in the book of Acts. And the fact that he said he was James's brother would have spoken profoundly to those that were reading this letter because James was kind of a big deal. Now, it's important to note, I think this is very important. I will reiterate it. It's important to note that if the Bible is true, and I believe it is, and the, if the Bible includes all of them, so in all probability, Jude was, along with his mama, Mary, and his other brothers present on the day of Pentecost in the upper room. Acts 1 and 14 tells us that Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brethren were there in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, and there, if he was in the upper room, and I believe he was, everybody in the upper room filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, right? Acts chapter 2, right. verses 1 through 4. The Bible says in Jude 1 and 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Now he says... He was the brother of Jesus by blood. He was a servant to Jesus by choice. And it was that choice, 
that he chose as his identifying characteristic rather than that he was a brother to him. And that is important because it was not the familial relationship that he wanted to be saved for posterity as it were, but it is the submissive relationship that he wanted to be saved for posterity. That's the one that would be recorded and we are reading it again today. He very willingly and clearly declares himself a servant to Jesus Christ and in the literal translation, rather than servant, that word literally means slave, which means as far as James was concerned, he had no real choice but to surrender to Jesus Christ. It expresses a submissive spirit. He addresses his letter to them. We'll move on from that from right now because it does make us a little bit uncomfortable. But the truth of the matter is we will have to be that submitted to Jesus Christ. He addresses his letter to them that are called. Now, I know in the King James Version that called comes last on Jude chapter number 1. But in the Greek lexicon, it comes first, which is they break every word down in the Greek and it comes first. Because the call comes first. Every human being receives the call. He reaches for every human being. Your relationship with God will always begin with a call. All right? Now just hang with me. We'll get cranked up in just a minute. Um, the word literally means called or perhaps better invited, and the invitation is summoned by God to salvation. Everybody gets that call. He died so everybody could be saved. It's important that we do not discount anyone. Absolutely, Josh. Thank the Lord for that. And everybody ought to echo that. Everybody ought to echo the fact that he calls everybody. The scripture very clearly declares that that call is universal. Matthew 20 and 16 says many are called, but few are chosen. And 1 Timothy 2 and I believe it's three through four, but we'll just use a part of it. It says, God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. He did say that he died or he took on the uh, penalty of sin. He is the propitiation of our sins, but not of our sins only, but the sins of the whole world. Okay. He wants everybody to be saved and the call comes to everybody. So he speaks generally to the call. The Help's Word study says it's the call he gives to all people so all can receive his salvation. But then he breaks it down a little further and, and, and begins to, to streamline who is called, who he's referring to, and he says, and the sanctified. Now the oldest transcripts in the original Greek here use the word beloved. And that is not a contradiction, but in fact validates the idea of sanctification. Because the emphasis of this word sanctification generally refers to the inward work that the Lord does on us. The, the, the process by which we uh, live, walk, and learn greater to live in salvation. But here it is referring to the, what, the mind and the expectation of God for us. It is not the work being done after us, but it's the work God had in mind for us from the beginning. And we've taught enough around here to know the Lord didn't wait till you were born to decide what to do with you. Okay, he called us before the foundation of the world or chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So, the mind or the expectation of God for us rather than the work of the Spirit in us. So he called them and then he sanctified them. He set them apart. It's the plan and the mind of God because the truth of the matter is, and I didn't want to delve into this, but I'm going to right now. There are going to be people that hear this letter read 
who ain't right. This is written to believers, those called, sanctified, and preserved in Jesus Christ. But there are going to be people read it who don't fit the criteria or people who hear it read who don't fit all the criteria. And we're going to delve into that later on in this. And you're going to find out everybody that is born again of the water and of the spirit ain't going to stick with him until the rapture. I guess I am going to say this. The problem in the book of Jude is not the world. The problem in the book of Jude is people in the church who refuse to surrender to the will of God but hold on to their own agenda. Now, Jesus very clearly said that that type of people is going to be in the church. And you know what he said we're supposed to do about it? Let them alone. Because you know what he said? He said, I'll separate the wheat from the tares in the harvest time. But it's going to happen. And we better learn how to treat those folks. Okay. Then he says, so we're called, then sanctified. God's got a special work for you. And then preserved. That's the third identifier of the addressees, and it speaks to the keeping of the believer in Jesus Christ. Fully and completely in alignment. There's that word again, men. In alignment with the will of God. And not only being in alignment with the will of God, but being in alignment with the will of God in accord with the example Jesus Christ set for us. Does that make sense? So I'm going to line up with the will of God, but I'm going to line up to the extent Jesus Christ did. You with me? Okay, kept, preserved. Jude acknowledges that first they're here because God called them. They, answering the call, have included themselves in the beloved, which is set aside especially for God, and they have been called to a place, they have arrived at that place, and they are kept at that place in Jesus Christ, surrendered and submitted. Paul gives a pretty clear glimpse of the status of the believers as referred to in the book of Jude in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, when he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Look at here. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. What happened right there? Called. That's when we're called. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That is preserved, kept, okay? Having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, which would be sanctified, set apart. Okay, you with me? Woo. Verse 2. Here's what we're talking about. That's why it's important to know who he's dealing with right here. Verse number 4 tells very clearly who he's dealing with, but we're not going to get to verse number 4 tonight. But he says, Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. I dare say, I want you to hear me now, I dare say that dealing with messed up people who are in the church may be the most difficult task the church has to do. <clears throat> Am I doing all right tonight, Brother Blake? Yes, sir. Well, I feel like I ain't connecting very good. Maybe we ought to just put the notes down and wait till three weeks from now. And, and we can play tic-tac-toe on the chalkboard. Y'all remember them days? Rainy recess days. Anybody remember them? When you couldn't play outside on recess, so we all lined up and played tic-tac-toe on the board. Anybody else try to get to clean out the erasers? 
Did anybody else ever try to do that? Boy, I did every chance I got. I think I got to do it once my whole career. <laughs> he says, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Now, this is more than just a salutation. Matter of fact, I read in a couple of commentaries that this is just really kind of weird. It's kind of different because though, even though so, so similar things are said earlier, not just in this way. Now, here's why. This is a launching pad for the seriousness of this letter. We do not have the privilege of separating mercy from truth. You know what I mean by that? Truth is important, but you don't have to be mean sharing truth. Just because somebody doesn't know the truth, you don't talk down to them. And sure enough, don't think you're all that in a box of Cracker Jacks because you do know. Because I'm telling you right now, you keep reading the Bible, you just all you do is find more you didn't know. He is letting them know this is a very serious word, but this is where we're going to end up at. In the multiplication of mercy, peace, and love. The place Jude is coming from, it's not just simply a maintenance word. You know what I mean by that? You know what I mean? But what's a maintenance word? Just, just kind of, just, just, just a little shot in the arm. Just check the oil. You know, just, just kind of, just a little word of encouragement. It's not just that. It's not just a maintenance word. But nor is it an antagonistic word. You ever been in, into it with somebody? I know some of y'all never have, but just bear with me. You ever had bad feelings about somebody and maybe nobody even knew about it? Now, here's what's happening right now. Everybody raise their hand. And the preacher starts preaching about something that you feel like is hitting them right between the eyes. Huh? That's what it means about the word being antagonistic. You want to run the aisles. Because you just know the Lord is setting them straight. <laughs> Y'all you know, know what I'm talking about. Uh huh. And you can't wait to get home and tell everybody. And here's how you feel like it. You feel like it. I was so mad at them, I forgot to pray for them, and the Lord came in and fixed them anyway. Huh? Y'all know what I'm talking about. That ain't what this word is. He's telling them right quick, I don't want you to think. I feel a little Holy Ghost moving right now, Brother Terrence. I don't want you to think that I'm giving you some ammunition. Why do we like to get ammunition? Makes us feel better. Ain't no room for that in the church. Ain't no room for that in the church. He says, it's not a maintenance word. It's not an antagonistic word. But the aim, my reason for writing this, is multiplication growth in mercy, which is compassion, which can't happen if you don't put yourself in their shoes. Let me tell you something. You're to a mature place. I'm doing all right now. I feel a little flow in the gold right now. You, you are not officially mature in Jesus Christ till you can empathize with a knucklehead. Sister Maria, what would happen to the kingdom of God if we had all start acting like Christians, even to goofballs? Huh? Because guess what? You've been one before. Come on now. 
You know what it's like to do something stupid and then go home and realize how stupid you just did it and how stupid you just looked and you don't ever want to go outside again. So you've got the ability to put yourself in somebody's position and when that happens, mercy, peace, and love are multiplied. And you realize that the aim is not destruction but edification. All right, let me move along here. The aim is multiplication, growth, and mercy or compassion. You know Jesus had compassion on the multitude that was hungry and it was not his fault. The disciples said the natural thing. We ain't got enough money for all these people. There ain't no way we can feed all these people. But the Bible says Jesus had compassion on them. You minister in compassion when good sense won't. And then he said, we're going to grow in peace. Everybody say peace. peace. That doesn't come from the Greek word shalom. It comes from the Greek word irene, E-I-R-E-N-E. And it means wholeness. Now let me tell you something. When the preacher starts preaching straight, the enemy and the flesh both agree there's a problem. And the enemy will make us think. Has anybody ever, this happened to me recently. Anybody ever got like this much bad news first thing in the morning? And before you know it, the whole world's coming to an end. Not just the day. I probably need to just quit my job. You know what? I, I, I need to put up my house up for sale. Before you know it, you will have convinced yourself all hell has broke loose in the whole world and we're just seconds away from a meteorite hitting us. That peace being multiplied, you know what that means? Going to fix that. Wholeness. So we got compassion toward them. And just because we're preaching straight about there being problems among you, don't think the church is falling apart. That's what he's talking about here. And love. And that, of course, yeah, God bless you. And that, of course, comes from the Greek word agape, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And it means the love of God and literally means that which God prefers. We're going to get things the way God wants them to be. Amen. And that's the aim. That's the goal. In short, the result of this letter is that their understanding of God be multiplied. Especially in light of those whose true motives will be revealed. And how we are supposed to behave toward them even though they're contrary. In fact, they are being used of the enemy to fulfill his purpose, which is still kill and destroy, and the church is in the crosshairs. And we're going to deal with them, and in the manner that we're going to deal with them, Mercy, peace, and love are going to be multiplied in you. Absolutely, absolutely, which is the greatest symbol of empathy there's ever been because Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. So he's basically saying, I'm going to let you connect 
with folks that's working for the devil. And when we get done, it's going to make you better. Now, here's why we got a little tight in here when I said that, is we're scared of it. Reconcile that fear that you feel with greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. How can you be afraid of letting God work? He, he said, we talked about it the other day, but anybody ever read this, the, seven, the letter to the seven churches? I can't even remember which one it is, but he said, I know you live where Satan's seat is. I know you're right in the middle of what the devil's doing, but I got my eyes on you anyway. You think we ain't living in that in this world right now? Huh? Come on now. I don't really want to get too political, but you just catch a little bit of the news and you'll figure out there's some people done lost their mind. Now, I'm supposed to hate them and talk bad about them and ridicule them and make fun of them and stay away from them unless I'm operating in the power of the Holy Ghost. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. You said that, you know, church people, people in church believe in God, and that's why you come face to face with the people that are working the devil. Yep. Uh, don't be scared of that. Well, of course don't be scared of it because, you know, the only way we get better and grow is through challenges and difficulties. Yes. If we were just in the same people in the same life cycle, in the same mind, we would never be comfortable with our lives and the people. Yeah. Absolutely. But, but our problem is, our problem is we learn, and I'm going to touch that in a minute, we teach our children, this is coming from elements class the other morning, we teach our children to avoid at any cost. But the Lord is telling them what I'm about to reveal to you, because the truth is they don't have the benefit of the book of Jude. They don't know what the Lord is fixing to reveal to them. Because again, I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but verse number four, he said, there are people that crept in unawares. They don't know that yet. So he's making sure we got something clear. This letter, when that gets done, mercy, peace, and love multiplied. Okay? Then he says, Verse 3, he cuts right to the chase. This is a little bit different too because normally they talk a little bit longer about who they are and what they've done, but he cuts right to the chase. Then he says again, beloved. Now I've taught you many times. That's another sign that lets us know he's talking to church folks. He says, beloved. I like what it means. Divinely loved ones, those which are loved by God. But it's important to note when he says beloved, that's a big deal right there. Because when he tells them divinely loved ones, he's not telling them I'm just writing to a bunch of my friends. He's telling them what? What I'm about to tell you ain't coming from my mind or my heart, but from this is a God thing that's about to happen here. This is a spiritual thing that's about to happen here. Beloved. It's important that they know that the inspiration of this letter comes from heaven. He said, when I gave all diligence. Now, let me tell you what he's talking about right there. The work he's put in to bring in this letter to them. It speaks to the seriousness with which he took the desire to reach out to them. And the word in this case shows that before he reached out to them, he sought after the will of God. And he's telling them, this is what God wants me to do for you. This is where God wants me to be. So he had a desire to reach out to these people. He didn't really know where he was going, Brother Terrence. He didn't really know what he was going to say. He just knew he had some want to in him. I can preach a little bit right now. 
He knew he had a desire welling up in him. So instead of just taking off, he said, you know what? I believe I want to write a letter to them folks. So let's just break out the old computer and let's get the old printer and let's just... No. He had a desire without any direction. So he took that desire to the Lord. And he put a lot of effort. What would you think that is? What kind of effort do you think he put in? Just knowing the Bible, flowing in the Spirit, what kind of effort do you think he put in? Praying, there we go. Fasting, there we go. Praising, probably so. How about some practice? Well, I feel like this is what the Lord wants. And about halfway through, the Holy Ghost says, wad it up, throw it in the trash. It's not it. Let's refine it a little bit. There's some effort, some energy, some work has went into this. He said, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Everybody say common. common. What do you automatically think about when we say common? Plain. There we go. It seems that his first desire was to just write a word of edification regarding the salvation. But common is not a demeaning or belittling word. But it declares, you ready for this? The persevering exclusivity of this salvation. Y'all got that? What does that mean? I hoped you would ask. That which was delivered and received in the beginning, which is what? What's the beginning? Pentecost. That remission, repentance and remission of sins would be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. When Peter, when they, uh, in Acts 11 and 15, when Peter is getting called on the carpet by the Jews because he went and preached to the Gentiles, he said, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Okay? So the, the writer Jude, who was in the Pentecost, in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, is talking about a common salvation. You know what that is? It's the same one we all have. It's not saying it's little or demeaning. or, or it, it is that this same salvation has been persevering. The same message. The Pentecost message. And it's continuing up to including now. These people that he's writing to, I don't believe this is a stretch. These people that he's writing to, please allow me to say it this way. Please understand that I know that the Pentecost church as a whole began January 1st, 1901. But let me tell you something. Pentecost has never stopped since the day of Pentecost. You know how I know that? Because the Bible says upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now look at here. You understand what I mean by common salvation? It's sure enough, hear me right now, it is sure enough not saying whichever one of them you have. He said, I started out to write to you about this common salvation that we have. Are we all right? That means it's the same one. So it means that the 120 in the upper room were there on the beginning, at the beginning, on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter number 2, verses 1 through 4. We know that Jude was one of the brothers of Jesus. And Acts chapter 1, verse number 15 says that they were in the upper room too. So that means near about 70 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that people are still receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, uh, repenting of their sins, being baptized in Jesus' name, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost just like they did on the day of Pentecost. And that's who he's speaking to. I want you to think about something. We, we, we'll talk about that later. I need to write myself a note because the Lord's still downloading into me for like the next couple weeks. Sure. No, it's not.
No, sir. No, sir. And that's, thank you for saying that. Because that's what that means. That I'm talking to people who are apostolic in the book of Jude. I'm not dealing with people that believe different things. I'm talking to the church, the common salvation. Believe the same thing. Have the same experience. As and, oh, blah, 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 blah. and he said in Galatians chapter 1, you come preaching anything else? Yes, ma'am. It does. It does. A common experience. That's why Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. And what Jude is telling them is, I, is all right? He said, I know what you got. It's the same thing we got. I'm glad you did too. I'm glad you did too. Now understand, based upon everything we've taught already, you cannot. Get prideful over the doctrine. Because what happened if you had been raised up in a house full of atheists? You'd have a lot harder road to hold than you do now. If, you ain't, if you've been raised up in this apostolic truth and you hadn't thanked God for it in a hot minute, you better... Sometimes, honey, sometimes I try to wrap my mind around how big a deal that is. Okay? But it is important to note that the next to the last book, there are some people that even say that this book was written closer to 100 years after the death of Jesus Christ. But the truth of the matter is, is it still made a difference what you believed and experienced. Brother Blake, it meant something that he said. It's the same experience. The same, are you ready for this? Salvation. All right. I don't want to stay on it, but thank you. Thank you for that. And then he says, when I gave all diligence, when I put in a lot of fasting and prayer, I knew I just wasn't writing you a hey, how you doing kind of note. But I, I had something on my heart, and then the Lord began to unpack it. And then he said, it was needful. Everybody say needful. I looked it up. I was blown away. I only got like a half a sentence with this. He said, there was a violent compulsion. When I started seeking after God, it became very clear and the urgency, has anybody heard that word before? The urgency was upon me. And it became a violent urge. The need was very powerful. He said, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you. And I hope you remember this word because this is the one that says, I want to make a call to you up close and personal, a close beside call. Jude will present his case to them and then we'll make an up close and personal call for you to come alongside of me. There we are, Sister Lacey. That is that unifying aspect. We got it all. And then he says that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which we're going to hit in just a minute, to contend earnestly. I wrote that word on your paper. Now, y'all be laughing at me sometimes when I try to pronounce them words. So, Sister Callie, won't you pronounce that for us? Thank you. 
Thanks, Sister Kelly. I will say that might be the best I've heard because I didn't come close to that. But it means there'll be a struggle which calls for effort. And the importance of the fact, the, the importance of knowing this is that your commitment will come under attack. And it will cost you something to stand. Now, does anybody want to just kind of, the third letter to the eighth letter? Anybody kind of want to pronounce that for me? Huh. Agonize. It's not in there by accident. And in order, because he said you're sanctified, you, you've been called and sanctified and preserved and you've received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but now we're going to another level. My call is not that you be saved. My call is not that you have great worship. My call is that you earnestly contend Agonize, as it were. You've got to be completely sold out to what you believe in. Now, this word, boy, I want to—I really want to homestead right here for a minute. Is everybody with me tonight? And we started a little slow, but I think we're, we're blowing and going now. I want to unpack here for just a minute. There's going to be a struggle. Your commitment is going to come under attack. I'd like for you to just for um, like five seconds, exactly what does that look like? What would cause me to think about giving up? And then ask yourself this question. How difficult would it be for me to give up? What? Think about over the last year maybe, over the last six months, maybe this morning. When the enemy had free reign to say, Justin, about time to quit. You put on a good show, man. You give it a good shot, man. We're all proud of you, but hang it up, bro. You did a good job, but everybody knew you weren't going to stick it out anyway. So, so hang it up now. Yes, sir. Brother, that's 100% truth. So think about it just for a minute. What would happen? What has happened to cause my commitment to be in question? How, how easy have I been willing to sell out? Bad day at work? Here we go. Here we go. Light bills due on the 15th. It's $227, and I only have eight bucks in my account. I've had people tell me this. First off, let's get something right. You don't pay your tithes. You return your tithes. Okay, because it's all the Lord's. But I have had people, Sister Maria, get in financial distress and say to me, say to me, I can't figure it out. I paid my tithes and everything. You know what's really happening in the mind, Brother Shannon? You know what's happening in the mind? If I had enough, I'd have that money to pay that light bill right now. I think I'm just going to quit. Oh, man. (laughs) 
Josh, sometimes, buddy, sometimes you have got to have had your feet in the fire to be able to really appreciate what God's doing in your life right now. You get things when you've had your feet in the fire. Y'all understand what I mean by that? When it, whoo, Holy Ghost, when it was almost over. You got to be completely sold out. This word, and I'm, I'm, I'm not hurrying. That, that's just a bad habit I got into. Please forgive me. Because I can't hurry through this. We ain't trying to just fill up some time. We're trying to get prepared to grow in love and compassion and mercy and grace and be more like him and less like me. There are two things it's going to take. Commitment and skill. Hmm. What does that mean? This word lends itself to the idea that the struggle is going to be twofold. One that will require both commitment and skill. What do you think about that when I say that? What, what do you think? Commitment and skill. I want to think that all I got to do is just hold on. But that's not what he's writing. He said that you earnestly contend. Brother Blake, reckon how many people have bought into that idea of earnestly contending with only a commitment and lacking the skill. I know that violates our sense and sensibility of what it means to be apostolic, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to go to the Word and prove it to you. James chapter number 1, verse 2 and 3 says, Count it all joy. Dumb verse. When you fall into diverse temptations, that means all different kinds of them. Test. Test. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And here's why you count it joy. Because you know that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Yes, sir. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Keep going, that's right. Uh-huh. Absolutely, the Lord's going to use it for good. Back me up one real quick. I want to move in here for a second. Let's be honest. Let's just be real. How are we doing on this? Really? You know what? That's all right, Brother Bucky. That's all right. But the Bible don't say just give it your best shot. So you know what I got to do? Got to stay in. And I got to come to Bible study on Wednesday night where I find out how to take what I've been going through and make it work for me. Well, old brother Larry, he sings it. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. It almost sounds like that. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Because I've got to realize, brother Ronnie, you know what? Ooh, baby. I done went through this on Monday. I done went through this on Tuesday. And I went through it on Wednesday and almost didn't come tonight. All right. Reckon why that's happening that way. 
What'd you say, Shelly? Okay, doing something right, or God's got a message for me, God's got a lesson for me, and I ain't got it on Monday, and I ain't got it on Tuesday, and I didn't get it on Wednesday. And so here I am tonight. Count it all joy when you go through all different kinds of tests because you know that the trying of your faith worketh, keeps on working patience. It's going to require commitment and skill. Are y'all ready for this? Take me to the next verse. You think it's hot down here, Sister Sheila. You ought to be up there. <laughs> for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. I'm having to start all over, right back where I started. Now, Sister Maria, I would say that that first phrase says there'll be a time when every last one of us is supposed to be investing in somebody else. There's a time that comes when we're supposed to be investing in somebody else. But, Brother Blake, the problem with that time is I got to start all over, right, with everything I've been doing. And you are become such as have need of milk and not meat. Look at here. I love it. This is powerful. You can't make this stuff up. For everyone that useth milk is You know what that means? I feel a little Holy Ghost moving on me, Justin. That means that you've heard it and you've heard it and you've heard it and you've heard it and you've read it and you've heard it and they've heard it and you've read it and you still don't know what to do with it. Am I doing all right? And let me tell you something, Brother Justin. I didn't used to always be the pastor. Brother McKinnon used to be the pastor. And you know what that meant? I heard a lot more stuff than I do now. Because y'all talk amongst one another when you don't come to the pastor. And you know what we used to say? I used to hear it. I never did say this, thank God. Might sound self-righteous. Might say, oh, whatever. But I didn't ever say this. Don't you ever get tired of hearing Brother McKinney teach the same old thing over and over and over again? One God, one God, one God, one God, one God, one God. All he ever wants to talk about is one God. Reckon why that is. Think it might be you didn't ever learn what to do with it? Say, I don't like that kind of preaching. Take it up with Hebrews 13 right here. Hebrews chapter number 2, I believe it is. Chapter 5, verse 13. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to move up to a new level. And you ain't going to do that through more shouting. You ain't going to do that through better music. You ain't going to do that through better singing. You're going to do that about learning something with the word. It matters, especially when Jesus Christ is face to face with the devil himself. And every word that come out of his mouth was prefaced by it is written. Better learn to do something with that word. Man, I feel a little Holy Ghost anointing moving in here right now. Let me go ahead. Uh 
Uh huh. One part is going to try it. Another part is going to refine me. Another part is going to transform me. I can go through the same thing 15 times and miss something in each one of them. Yes. I got right. I got this one right this time, but I missed it. There you go. Over and over. That's beautiful. Yes. Perfect. 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 But I can't do that if I don't know why it's in my life. I think it's in my life because God's mad at me. Really, I think it's happening in my life because, well, he just don't love me as much as he does other people. We all got a reason why it's happening except to count it all joy. Now, for everyone that, thank you, Sister Leanne. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Ladies and gentlemen, hanging around seniority don't mean squat in the kingdom of God. We don't even like that right now. Just because you manage to hang around for a long time mean, don't mean that you are skillful in the word of righteousness. Oh, am I... Is that too dangerous? Is that, is that too dangerous? Look at verse 14. You can't make this stuff up. But strong meat belonging to them that are of full age. That don't have nothing to do with how many birthdays you've had. That's how many trials you came through, Sister Leanne, and you gleaned one thing out of that one and one thing out of that one and one thing out of that one until you become, are you ready for this? Perfect. That's what the book says. Because perfect means mature or complete. And you're going to have to keep going through it until you get everything God has for you. He does not get frustrated like we do with our kids. Even those who by reason of use Do you really believe God let you have kids to stop every bad thing from happening to them? From saving the day and every Did you think God let you have children and grandchildren so you could pretend like you wear a cape? I'm about to tell a story, man. I got it this from the Gospel of Louis. Who by reason of use what do you think that's talking about? Have their senses exercised. Brother Cody, when you lift weights, it ain't doing no good if it don't hurt. Because everybody knows no pain, no. I've been through some things. And I have become skillful in using the word of righteousness. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now elements class. We said let the opposition and the difficult experiences our children face prepare them for contending for the faith. Rather than being cool at school. Has anybody, since we talked about that in Elements and we're talking about it tonight, has anybody felt the spirit of conviction from trying to get in and save every kid from every cotton-picking thing they go through? Yeah. Yeah. I ain't throwing no rocks. Please, please understand. But I remember my mama when we didn't have no money. She found a shoe store at Paducah that carried cool shoes. And her and daddy drove over there in the middle of the night to get us some shoes with the right brand on them. Y'all may think I'm lying, but if I had it to do over again, I'd let her go to pee in her every time I needed a new pair of shoes. I'm ashamed of myself, Brother Shannon. I remember Mama waking me up like 1 o'clock in the morning. She was so happy I got some Velcro ponies. They were gray with the maroon pony stripe on them. 
but I'm ashamed of it now. I wouldn't mind, I'd like to go back to school like that little boy Garrison saw one time was wearing water shoes in the winter time. Hear me now. Truth is cheating our children out of becoming adults and ready to graduate from milk to meat. And that's why we have so many people, spiritually speaking, that are still on the bottle and sitting at the kids' table when they ought to be eating with the big people. Because we don't want them to have to go through no trouble like we did. Say, I know you're, I'm, I'm not just talking about tennis shoes and I'm not just talking about Levi's or, or any of those other. I remember when gasoline jeans was cool. I probably don't know about even know nothing about that now. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about going through some things spiritually. Remember, Lacey, we talked about when the two little girls were mean to you in kindergarten. The carnal mama wants to wade off in there and say, let me tell you something, you two little heifers. If you ever breathe the same air as my little girl again, I'm going to turn you ever which way but loose. Whoop them bad little kids. <laughs> but after learning what we're learning right now, let me tell you something, sweetie. That's just the beginning. How about this? I know this sounds, y'all going to think I'm sounding all super religious. Let me tell you something. It'll work. Tell your kid. They tell you you can't be at their table no more. Just start laying hands on every one of them and claiming the blood of Jesus and praying the power of the Holy Ghost. You have that table all to yourself, baby. <laughs> I, I'm being a little funny about that, but I'm telling you, maybe it's time that we put, the, put our arm around them and tell them that don't feel good, does it? But you know I'm for you. And I know I can't be at the lunch table with you, but I'm telling you right now, you know what the Bible says? Count it all joy. Instead of trying to, oh, I'm not going there, but I want to. Look at here, let me move on. Let me tell you this story. I read it. Hondo. Anybody ever read the book Hondo by the prophet Louis Lamar? I read this story. I'm just being facetious. He ain't a prophet, but he's a pretty good old dude. This guy named Hondo shows up in the middle of the desert, and he meets this, this and they're going to get together at the end, in case you was wondering, But because uh, there's always some romance in Louis' books. And he comes up on this gal, her name Angie Lowe, and she's got a little boy, and Hondo is a big, bad, mean dude. He's got a big, bad, mean dog with him. And the first day he walks into the yard, the little boy wants to play with the dog like any other little boy does. And Hondo leaned over to the little boy and said, we don't pet him. He don't like to be pet. He'll bite you. Leave him alone. Everything's cool till the next day. The little, I, this is going, we're going to have some mamas and some grandmas go, oh, how dare he? The next day, the little boy says to the dog, points at him, and says, pet. And Hondo said, get after it. <laughs> he did. And the little boy reached out for the dog, and the dog went, and snapped at him. And the little boy went running to his mama. And you know what his mama did? Yelled at Hondo and said, how dare you let him get treated like that? And Hondo said, I done told him he was going to get bit. That didn't work. Now he knows what's going to happen. She was all tore up, squalling and mad, ready to attack the man. He said, I done told him don't mess with him. I tell you what, right now, I'm I want you to hear me. It ain't easy to let the dog snap at your baby. But it'll teach him something. Then he says, earnestly contend for the faith. That article, the, anybody, you English people know the difference between, I started to go over here to Miss, Sunday, Miss uh, School Teacher, Sister Crystal, 
but I ain't going to put her on the spot because she's going to get nervous and forget everything she ever learned. <laughs> but V can either be an, it's an article, and it can either be a definite article or an indefinite article. I could come back there to Dave, too, because he teaches at an institution of higher learning, <laughs> Southeast Missouri State University. He is the man what runs with the football. I, I got off in another gospel of Jerry. The faith is a definite article, not indefinite. And it's because it's used intentionally there because the faith is not referring to your faith in simply believing. Okay, it's not talking about the faith that uh, uh, the, the quality of believing. It's talking about what you believe. It's not just talking about the idea of looking out there, there's faith. It's talking about what makes up the faith, the entire embodiment of things believed. It isn't just our ability in the book of Jude and today. It isn't just our ability to believe that's under attack. It's the very essence of what we believe. They're not just trying to make you doubt. They're trying to destroy everything you've ever believed in. Does that make sense? Then he says, the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. We cannot be mistaken as to the clarity of what's being said as if he was telling them that which was once upon a time delivered the saints. But in reality, the word once means, are you ready? Once and for all. It's not talking about earnestly contend for faith that they've lost, but earnestly contend for the faith that's under attack. Everything you believe is under attack. Can I get an amen in the house? Amen. Hebrews 2, 1 through 3, and I'm bringing it home, baby. You can be happy. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Every now and again, put some more effort into reestablishing yourself in the doctrine rather than give me something new. Right. Yeah. Give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip. Let me tell you what the picture of that word is. The picture of that word is those of you that are fishermen that have boats. It is a boat. Let them slip is a boat that used to be tied to the dock that somebody turned it loose. But let it sit there. And guess what happened? Just begin to drift away. If you don't go back and visit the things which you've heard, you will let them drift away. All right. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of a war, reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Look at this. Here's that common salvation, Josh, which was first spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. So the Lord revealed it. Them that heard him received it. And then what did they do with it? They told somebody else about it. It's the same common salvation in the book of Hebrews. It's the one that came from Jesus Christ himself. Jude desires that they are very aware of what they're fighting for. And what they're fighting for is that which is built by Jesus Christ that the gates of hell are coming against. 
the church, the ecclesia, the called out. They're fighting against the revelation of Jesus Christ. They're fighting against the, uh, or losing the revelation of Jesus Christ. They're fighting against losing that everybody has the privilege of the new birth. And they're fighting against, are you ready for this? It's in the book of Jude. It's in chapter, in verse number four. They're fighting against losing holiness of lifestyle. All areas. That's what the faith is. It's the total package. The common salvation has always been exclusivity, purity, and holiness. Gospel, chapter, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through 17 in the NIV says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Got to get this settled. First to the Jew, that's how it happened, then to the Gentile, next verse. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. It is a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. The faith never stops. In the King James it says is revealed from faith to faith. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Ladies and gentlemen, your faith not only depends on your ability to believe, your faith is useless without something to believe in. Amen. Stand with me. I'm going to tell y'all something. I don't want nobody trying to cheat. And I hope Meredith's not in here. Sister Meredith wrote for the bulletin Sunday. You ain't put it out yet, have you? Don't leave without a copy of the bulletin. What she wrote in that bulletin, and if y'all tell her this, we're going to fight. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. I've already told her. It's one of the greatest things I've ever read in my life, aside from the Bible. It's incredible. What she wrote. You're going to be surprised. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. But don't, don't, don't leave without getting a copy of that bulletin. If you run out, uh, Sister Mando will give you some more. It's incredible. It really is. I read it today and goose, I near about cried. Goosebumps run all up and down me. So, any announcements? Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for where you want us. Thank you for reminding us that there's ways we got to behave, we got to act, but, but above all, we got to fight for this. We got to contend for it. And the way that we contend for it is by getting it down inside of us and living it to the fullest and, and allowing the Holy Ghost to overwhelm our carnal ideologies where we feel like we got an eye for an eye and all that other stuff. But help us to love our enemies and pray for them that despitefully use us and, and help us, God, to begin to behave like you in this world and sure enough in the church. And you're reminding us, God, there are people, Lord, that have been ordained for division, but we got the way we treat them declares who we really are in you. And I thank you, God, for your word tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'll see you all Sunday.